I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. For several hundred pages, you've got two people gazing at one another across a crowded room and wishing that they could be alone. And, uh, and you put the reader through all that. And then, of course, at some point, you've got to give the reader the reward. But the longer we live with these two people wishing for it, the more they and we are going to enjoy it when it actually happens. Oh, my God, that's a great quote. Hold on a second. <laughs> of course, the book has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But each chapter should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And within that chapter, each scene should oh have God. a beginning, a middle, and an end. I love this. That exactly applies to life because I feel like people go through the school system, educational system, they get a job, they get promotions, and they do that for 40 years and they retire. But I think instead living life as a fractal is a much more interesting way to do it. Design Crowd is a website that helps startups and small businesses outsource or crowdsource custom graphics, logos, and web design from over half a million designers around the world. Check out designcrowd.com slash James, D-E-S-I-G-N-C-R-O-W-D.com forward slash James to learn more and receive a special $100 VIP offer when you start your next project or simply enter the discount code James when posting a project on Design Crowd. So I am so excited. I have Ken Follett here, author of this is th- we're talking about novel number thirty one, right? A column That's of correct. Fire. Yeah. So a column of fire, but not only thirty one novels. Your books have sold over one hundred fifty million copies, which is incredible. I don't know where you are in the list of best selling authors of all time, but put it this way: you're on the same list that the authors of the Bible are on. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I'm very excited. I've been, I, I mentioned to you outside, but I didn't tell you the book. I've been reading you for about, uh, I want to say now, I can't even, 38 years. And I'll tell you the very, or maybe even a little longer, I'll tell you the very first book I read by you. I did not know it was by you. I just read it because I was, I was a little kid. I was reading this book. And you'll be surprised, Capricorn One. <laughs> Ah, incredible. So, How yeah. did you get hold of that? Well, I didn't see the movie. I missed it. You know, movies, were, you know, that, it's not like we had like 
Hulu or Amazon. You could download the iTunes. You could download the movie later. I missed the movie. I was an 11 year old kid. My parents never took took me to it, or or I was younger. And um, uh, O.J. Simpson was in it. It was this faking of the moon landing. You know, the the conspiracy theory kind of kicked off the conspiracy theory, or was related to it. And you wrote the novelization of it. I did not realize until yeah. recently. Well, you know, I had just uh, quit my job and uh, become a full-time writer. I had written Eye of the Needle, but it had not been published. And so so this was the Capricorn I, one was like no, novel I, number 10 or 9? Uh, yeah, somewhere in there. And, and I needed the money. Uh, a publisher said to me, uh, I need somebody to write a novel based on this script. And uh, I, it took me a month. And I got paid two thousand pounds, and I was very grateful for that money. I can tell you. Yeah, sure. I bet you a lot of people would like that start even today. Yes. To get <laughs> a movie that was pretty widely seen, yes. and get let's say three thousand dollars or two thousand dollars to just spend a month doing the novelization of it. Did you think that would be? I, I, this is going off on a tangent because I want to talk about your other thirty novels, not Capricorn One. This is probably your least interesting, important novel. But uh, did you think that would be your career at that point? You hadn't yet had your breakout hit. Uh, That's right. You had just quit your job, so you were, you were scared a little, probably. That's yes, right. You're right. And and did you think, okay, they'll just keep feeding me? There's never. I, I might run out of ideas, but they're never going to run out of movies. So. Well, uh, it's that I sort of. It was something like that. I was, of course, hoping that uh, that I would write a bestseller, but also, Plan B might have been that I would get this kind of hack work, um, turning a film script into a novel. Hack work. I thought that was a great novel. I was 11. I was <laughs> well, great. I think I read it listen, twice. <laughs> listen, um, you uh, it, at, at the age of 11, you could have been my biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so interesting though because so many people like pour their heart into their first novel and usually those are very good novels, you know, these coming of age, you know, like their their souls torn out and and then it, it got, comes out and it and it invariably fails as most novels do or or you know, the average novel unlike yours, the average novel out there probably sells between one and two thousand copies, even done by a major publisher. Uh, your first breakout hit, Eye of the Needle, sold over ten million copies. So until book, when you were doing books through t- through ten, um, before Eye of the Needle came out, what were you thinking? Were you thinking what were you thinking? What the heck am I doing? Why why do I think why do why am I allowed to sit at home and write words and barely make ends meet? But I get but while everyone else is going to work. Well, I guess. I guess it was like this. I, I wrote my first novel. Uh, it wasn't very good, but it got published, but it didn't sell very well. But I was encouraged enough, okay, to think, all right, maybe if I work a bit harder, take a bit longer, the next one will be a huge international bestseller. Now, I want to break that part, though. Uh, uh, the work harder, take a bit longer, and you were encouraged enough. What encouraged you enough in that very first one? Just the fact that it got published. You know, that was enough. That was enough. You, well, you held could, on to that every time you had a thought of fear. Listen, I was a newspaper reporter, and every sooner or later, every newspaper reporter tries to write a novel, okay? <laughs> and then you get to the point when you're writing your first novel, this is how it goes. At first, it's great fun. You create these characters, you create these scenes, you get up to maybe 50 pages, maybe 100 pages. The novelty wears off. And you start to think, shall I work on my book tonight or shall I go to the pub? <laughs> or- by, by pub, I could tell by your accent you're from Brooklyn. So <laughs> you mean the local... No, you're from... You were, you, were, you were in London. You were a reporter in London. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And what happens is that everybody runs... Everybody begins to run out of steam. Writing their first novel around about page 50 or 100, they begin to run out of enthusiasm. And, and that's why... Everybody who actually finishes a novel has got a stubborn streak. And uh, that was the case with me. So finishing alone is, is finishing it is that, a, it's, it's, it's the you, success of that stubborn, stubborn streak. You've got it. Finishing it alone is an achievement. So that, I'd finished it, and somebody had liked it enough to actually print it. And even a few people had bought it. So... You know, I was 90% of the way there at that point. I had uh, it, I had jumped a few hurdles. And I'm sorry to always interrupt because everything... It's okay, no, interrupt, me. interrupt. Yeah, so, so you say you were 90% of the way there. This is all in your head. Like, some writers will say, oh, only 
4,000 people bought the book. And by the way, I'm assuming fewer than 4,000 people bought your first book. That's right. And so some people will say, Four, only 4,000 people bought my book. I'm 10% of the way there. I'm giving up. And so what what does it mean? How did Why was your brain different that you said, I'm 90% of the way there? I, do you know, I don't know the answer to that question. I just know that I've always had an optimistic streak. And I've always kind of thought uh, that, that I could do things by persisting, you know? And I think that part of my personality comes from my dad. Uh, do you know, have you ever had the experience of at, at breakfast time, you've got a jar of, uh, of strawberry jam or something and the, the lid gets stuck because n- nobody's opened it for six months or something. And you can't open the, okay, you know, now, My dad wasn't a particularly strong man, but you would always give the jar to him because if it took him 15 minutes, he would shift that lid, that stuck lid, just by sticking at it. And I always remember that, and I suppose the idea that you, if you just kept on at something, you would probably succeed in the end somehow must have filtered into my mind from my dad. That's a very true idea in the sense that, um, I mean, there's lots of books about the so-called a uh, 10,000 hour rule where if you put in enough hours, eventually you will achieve, you know, of deliberate practice, eventually you will achieve, you know, greatness at it, or at least the best of your potential. And if you put in those hours, eventually you're going to, um, and I'll be competitive. I, eventually you will defeat the ones who didn't, who gave up, who didn't put in the 10,000 hours. At some point you'll be the, one of the few people who wrote 11 novels and the skill will kick in and you will have done it. So, so you wrote that first one, you, you, you felt 90% of the way there, three people read it, I published it, I finished it. It's like this trifecta of, uh, for an optimist, which is that you, you, you finished it, it got published, and some people read it. Yeah. And so then you decided to write the second one. Yeah, yeah. But then I had a series of books which were published but, but did not sell very well. Didn't the publisher want to give up on you? Well, I kept moving to another publisher. <laughs> yeah, but wouldn't they say, oh, if this publisher rejected you, why? we're like the third. Well, you know, you'd think that, wouldn't you? But somehow there was always another publisher who read my stuff and thought, maybe this guy's got something. So, you know, credit to them for for seeing something in my work, even though my work in those days was not successful, they saw something in it. And what I would do is I would go to the bookstore and at the front of the bookstore, there would be a pile or a whole shelf of 100 copies of the latest by Frederick Forsyth or Sidney Sheldon. Great authors. Harold Robbins in those days was the most popular author in the world. And John le Carre also. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And down the, at the back of... Right at the back of the store, there would be two copies of Ken Follett's new book. And so I used to think, right, what do I have to do to get my book from the back of the store to the front? Why is it that this bookseller is looking at Forsyth and saying that's for the front of the store and Follett's at the back of the What do I have to do? to produce the book that make the bookseller say, oh boy, this is going to fly out of the store. I'm ordering 150 copies and I'm going to put them right at the front of the store. And I spent, you know, all those, all that time I was writing those unsuccessful books. I was thinking, okay, what is it? What do I have to do? And then finally I figured it out. Well, what, tell, tell us the, can you tell us? <laughs> well, the, the breakthrough book was Eye of the Needle, as right. you know. And I did, first of all, It was a high-concept idea. A German spy in wartime England discovers the deception plan for the Normandy invasion. That's easy to understand. But I did other things. But but combined with, always interwoven with a love story. Oh, yes, always. Because I've read many of your stuff. There's there's always a love story. Yeah, Yeah, there's always a love story. Well, in in a minute, I'll tell you the reason for that. But the thing, with Eye of the Needle, I did... I, there's certain things I did differently. It was the first book that I researched, and I found that that worked for me. All my books now are heavily researched. I enjoy it, and the readers enjoy having a background of accurate information, a richly detailed background, a historical period, or it might be World War II, but it's richly detailed and it's accurate. And I will say the real purpose of this particular podcast is I want to talk about A Column of Fire, or, or at least, um, you know, great book but what you can see when reading it is again i think if it wasn't heavily researched 
the reader would feel that. So yeah. the reader could tell the difference between, I mean, I might not know a lot about Elizabethan England, but just the level of detail, uh, whether it's true or not, I sort of felt everything was true, but I even think Kingsbridge is true, like by the end of the the whole the whole novel. So, so, well, so I think the reader you're... notices the difference. I think you're absolutely right. Even if you don't know about the historical period, you can tell when the author's faking it. I it's think the same thing for TV or movies. Yeah. You know, and I think that separates yeah. out a lot of, yeah. uh, you know, I, I've um, worked with several television shows, for instance, and there's a lot of thought put into how realistic can we make this be to, to, to a level of detail that the viewer will not know, but it's important to still have that level of detail. That's absolutely right. That's my philosophy, and you're right. Good television shows take the same view. And so, so okay, so with Eye of the Needle, you, you, it sort of like flipped the switch. I'm, like the structure was probably, and to, other than Capricorn One, I hadn't read the earlier ones before Eye of the Needle. I've read a, after that uh, uh, many, but uh, was the structure the same in terms of, okay, I hit the right moments on a thriller, uh, uh, but now I'm going to take this new level of, as you put it earlier, are you going to work a little harder with the research and you're going to take a little longer? So was that the difference? What was the... Was the that second... The one difference was the research. The second difference was that I planned Eye of the Needle. It was the first book for in which I didn't just sit down and write chapter one. I sat down and wrote, wrote an outline of mm. how the book would go. And once again, that works for me. And, and I've done it ever since and my outline huh, some of my outlines now are um, as long as some of my early books <laughs> that's funny i was gonna say your outline for this couldn't be bigger than this because this is like 910 pages so, yeah it was a long it's a long outline but that works for me and that's because if you want to write successful popular fiction what people love is getting lost in the story and that means that there mustn't be any boring bits you know, there must always be some dramatic question in the reader's mind that makes the reader want to turn the page and just make it makes you makes you say, "I'll just read a little bit more. I'll just read a little bit more." So that's interesting—a dramatic question, yeah. which could also be put as as a cliffhanger. So you know, you want—I I don't know if you think of it this way, but I, I always—it doesn't have to be a cliffhanger. It might, for example, be somebody telling a lie. And wondering if he's going to get found out. It's not quite a cliffhanger, but it's a dramatic question. Well, somebody takes a little risk. I'll tell a fib. I might get away with it. And then you think, okay, well, I'll just read far enough to see if he gets away with telling this lie or whether he gets found out. But by the time you find out the answer to that question, there's another dramatic question creeping into the story. So when you're writing the outline, and I actually want to get to the, the what your beats that you always feel you need to hit for each book, and maybe they, they vary... Because you've switched, you know, the amazing thing about your career too is you've kind of, or not kind of, but you've switched genres yes. several times, or at least switched your focus several times. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you are you always thinking when you're writing the outline, what is the current dramatic question that's going to keep the reader going? Absolutely, uh, I look at every page that I write and I think, is there something on this page that's going to make the reader turn over to the next page? That is absolutely essential. That's so important. So you're thinking about that with every page. Yeah. Uh, and what are some so you mentioned one kind of, okay, I told a lie. Are people going to figure it out? And the lie has to be important. It has to have a certain level of importance so that if people figured it out, the structure would change. Well, this is where, this is where the rhythm comes in because, of course, not every page has a life or death dramatic question. You know, there might be six of those in the course of a book, but you wouldn't want that on every page because it would become, become like a Superman comic. It would become uh, too trivial. So... In between the big life or death dramatic questions, there are smaller ones like, will I get found or will he get or she get found out telling this little lie? Or let's say, uh, let's say somebody kisses uh, somebody that he shouldn't kiss. And did any, okay, and did anybody see? And what will happen if, and what will happen if somebody says, oh, oh, I saw, I saw him kissing that girl. And, so that's a slightly bigger one because now he's done something he really that's really great, but he thinks he might get in trouble about it. So that would be the kind and the of audience thing. is on his side. The audience is glad he did the kiss. Doesn't want him to get caught. Maybe yes, yeah, I, yes, of course. And that's absolutely essential because if you're going to care about this stuff, you have to like those people. 
or, or you can hate them also. That'll do just as well. well. Oh, so that's interesting. So the energy of hate is as strong as the energy of like, but I imagine, uh, I mean, you see it in a lot of current fiction, kind of the hero, bad actor. You know, be, uh, actor, I mean, in the kind of literary sense, not in the yeah, yeah. sense. So, so, but, but I think likability is a very important factor of your novels. It's, yeah. it's, the hero is sometimes has flaws, but has a larger than life quality in many cases. Yes. So, so what is, what is likability in your main character? Like, how do you, how, do, how quickly is, is it important to establish that likability? Cause I feel with this book, for instance, a column of fire, uh, the likability is there from like page five on. Uh, it's there right from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and from both the male and the female, just, you, I could say that spoiler because it's by page 10. Uh, well, this is why the principal characters in my stories are usually part of a family. Because if somebody's going to get in trouble uh, or take risks, then if he's got people around him who are worrying about him, a mother, or father or brother or sister or a girlfriend or a wife or kids who love him, if there's a family that's worrying about him, then you, as, as a reader, you will be inclined to share their concern. And now I've got you worrying about this guy, which is where I want you. When he gets in... That's so fascinating. So, yeah. so you, you basically teach the reader to like the main character by seeing that main character through the eyes of the people who love him as virtual as, as part of the story. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's fascinating. And that's also why, that's also one of the reasons for always having a love story. Because, of course, let's say that there's a, a woman in the story, a heroic woman in the story who's taking terrible risks. Two of the women in A Column of Fire, the principal women, Marjorie, the English Catholic girl, and Sylvie, the French Protestant girl, both of them take terrible risks. Sylvie smuggles Bibles from Geneva into Paris, and Marjorie smuggles Catholic priests into Protestant England to give the sacraments to English Catholics. And both of these women know that they, if they're caught, they'll be executed, and they'll be executed in pretty horrible ways, actually. Uh, and so... Uh, but there's somebody in the story who is in love with one of these women. So you see her taking the risks, and you see this guy who adores her. And if he can, he's going to marry her. But she's taking these risks. And so because he loves her, and you are seeing her through his eyes, you're absolutely terrified that something bad is going to happen to this girl. And that's... And that's what, as readers, and of course I'm a reader as well, I read all the time. As readers, we love to be drawn into the story in that way because it's, it's emotional. And really, the key to a successful book is that the reader shares the emotions of the people in the story. That's, that's, I haven't thought about it that way. So, and, you, and you mentioned, and, you, and I've seen you mention it before, you are and were a heavy reader. Obviously, you're a heavy reader to do all the research, but I'm uh, I'm also assuming you, you read all of your quote-unquote competitors, other sure, absolutely. Uh, books, uh, thrillers, literary, whatever. But it seems like you still had to write 11 books to get that breakout hit. Like what was, you, you know, book number, books number, we've talked about book number one and then two and three, someone took a chance. Book number seven, who... I don't think people take those chances anymore. Who's taking a chance on you on book well, number seven? They were also slightly different. And number seven was probably a story for children. Mm. And my own children at that time must have been between uh, six and nine, something like that. Uh, so I knew exactly what children of that age would like in a book. And I knew what they'd understand. I knew what words they'd understand and what words they wouldn't understand. I knew what thrilled them. Uh, I very much admire people who can write for children of all ages because I think it's very difficult. And I think I could only do it when I had, you know, my own children and was living with them every day and knew them that intimately. Because you're almost writing for them. I've written yes, a children's exactly. book yeah. and I've written specifically for my daughter. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, I, so you know. But I don't know if it was for all age, it was for her age. <laughs> But well, but then, but then it it will be. But you may find, you know, that uh, you may find that when she's forty, 
uh, you can't write a children's book because it's you, you're not that you're right. not intimately involved with kids. Right. So okay. So 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 not book seven, then book eight. You're you're back to I'm gonna do a spy novel or a thriller or whatever. Who says Ken Ken? Why don't you go back to being a reporter? This is like <laughs> enough already. What were your parents? What was your wife saying? Like, who 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 loved you to make you the main character in in what became a great thriller? Well, I guess I mean I was encouraged by my family and uh, m- my first wife Mary um, was was pretty tolerant in that. In those days, I would come home from working as a reporter and uh, sit down. Um, uh, I had a, a typewriter on a table in the bedroom and I would go to the bedroom and I'd sit down and I would work on my book for two or three hours in the evening. So um, it, it, uh, it took somebody um, with a great generosity of heart to say, well, okay, um, I haven't seen my husband all day and now I'm not going to see him all evening, but he's writing his book, so that's important. And then, and then the publisher, though, they would look at it and say, and say what? Well, I, they, would, they would say... Maybe this is the one, you know. Let's 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 give it a try. So, so they really wanted to help some group of people in the industry. Really, was they were dedicated to your career, which I don't think happens now. I think young writers now don't have that same kind of support system. Even if they're showing talent, it's all in the numbers. Well, I'm not sure you're right about that because I seem to remember people saying that sort of thing in the 1970s when I was trying to get started. Mm. That that. Years ago, it was possible, but now it's difficult. And that's really interesting. I would not have thought that. See, I always have... think of like the Maxwell Perkins model of like, let's take young Tom Wolfe, let's yeah. take young F. Scott Fitzgerald, and build his career over the next fifteen years. Well, what? Yeah. Well, okay. That's that is a slightly different thing, and and I'm not sure whether that happens. But in at my end of the world, where 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 we're talking about popular fiction, you have to remember that the, the book world is full of young people who want to make their name by discovering the next Ken Follett. And so they are actually very interested in young talent and they will read um, typescripts by unknown people in the hope that this will be the one that will be a breakout book for somebody who's going to be a very big author. But by, by book number 10 <coughs> or book number 9, are people <coughs> saying... Oh my gosh, Ken! We've given you ten chances, ten, ten strikes, and you're out. It's the well, wall. <laughs> you've got a point. You've got a point. Why were they not saying that? But they didn't. They just said, "Well, let's give this one a shot." Is that because of you? Like you come across as a very likable person. You know, you're. You know, you probably built. Did Did you put into work not only in the writing and building the skills. And as you said, you started doing more research. You started taking a little longer. You started outlining. So you're building a skill set book by book. And it probably required all those books to build that skill set. But were you also establishing your connections and friendships within the industry to make sure there was a net? No, You were sewing the net so nobody would give up on you. Well, there's there's a certain amount of truth in that. And some of those 10 early books were were not books that were possible bestsellers, but were were kind of bread and butter work um, for publishers. Capricorn One. As Capricorn, an that, that's a very good example. There was a French book about a, a bank robbery in Nice, France, um, which uh, which was which was very when it came in to the publisher, it was very badly done and the publisher looked for somebody to rewrite it. I see. So you were doing you started being their go to guy. So when you had the tenth book they were like, okay, we need our go-to guy. Let's put out the 10th book. Oh, he's got this one, Eye of the Needle. Maybe it'll do as well as the 10th book. We'll make our money back on it. We'll give him a small advance. Were your advances getting smaller in, in, during this time? No, actually, they were getting bigger. Mm-hmm. They were getting bigger. I think I got 200 pounds for my first book. Uh, and Capricorn one, I think I got 2,000 pounds for. So that was that was, that was really good thousand percent return? Yeah, that was uh, good progress. What about Eye of the Needle? What was your advance on that? Uh, I think that was also uh, no, that was one thousand five hundred pounds. Yeah, and and just to understand, I'm not going to always ask you about the money aspect, but I have the needle. You, the tenth book probably sold a few thousand copies, and I have the needle sold ten million. So, what was the deal on I have the needle? Like, did you have profit participate? Like, what was was the royalty decent? Yes, it was. Yeah, it was. And um, 
we sold it. So that was it. Was a British publisher who who actually bought it, and uh, then I by then I had an agent who sold it to an American publisher for a much better. I think it was ten thousand dollars we got from the American publisher. Was that the first time you had published with an American publisher? It wasn't actually one of my early books got published by uh, an American publisher again. Uh, somebody who thought maybe this will do very well, and it didn't do particularly well, but I was encouraged. Wow, my book's been published in the United States. Well, what what do you think made Eye of the Needle a little... I mean, I felt it was an extreme page-turner. Like, I think I read this, I'm going to say, 1992. Uh, literally, uh, you know, it was the typical size of your books. I read it between New York and LA on a plane. Like yeah. that's how much of a page turner it was. Like this is incredible. And so so uh what what turned you into a skilled technician of a thriller to and I'll get to, to what I mean by that in a second to an actual page turner like it's you gasp to turn the page. Well, I think uh the I mentioned two things, the research and uh, the plan. The plan is very important. The, the plan is necessary to make sure, as I said earlier, that there's always a dramatic question. But the other thing that I achieved with Eye of the Needle that had, that had eluded me before was the right pacing because I'd been a newspaper reporter. So all of my books were too short and too brisk. You know, when you write for a newspaper, you have to, you, you put the facts of the story one after another. And it's generally, you know, 10 paragraphs. Is and there's no reveal. Story. You have to, you're supposed to, they have the, what's called the lead. You're supposed yeah. to lead with the reveal. Exactly, exactly. So, yes, yeah, so there's no suspense. Um, and I had to unlearn newspaper writing. And I had to slow it down. And um, I, there's a big, in the middle of Ivan Neal, there's a big fight just between two men. And I said, okay. This fight has got to be six typed pages. Now, that may sound like a not a very literary thing to do, but my thought was, if there's going to be a fight, it should go on for a long time. And I, I, don't, I don't understand that. In the, well, well, actually, I want to I wanna take it a, a, a step back because I've heard you say this before about pacing. Um, so you're obviously saying slow it down. But that could also be boring if you don't do it right. Oh, you're right. Absolutely. Like a six-page fight could be really boring. It's like, it's like for me, I didn't enjoy uh, the movie uh, The Two Towers, which was the second movie in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, because it was all just fighting. Yeah. I hated it. So a uh, six-page fight sounds boring to me. But obviously, I loved it because I wet, bro okay. breezed right through it. And here's the key. For the fight to be exciting, you have to, be, you have to know those two men. Uh, and you have to know them intimately, and you have to care about them. You may love one and hate the other, which is the situation in Eye of the Needle. Or you may have more ambivalent feelings about them, but you have to be involved with them. So a fight, my rule is there should never be a fight at the beginning of a book because you don't care. You don't know these people who are fighting, and you don't care who wins, who loses, who gets hurt, you don't care. Unless there's a built-in likability. So Ian Fleming obviously starts every book off with, uh, or did start every book off with a fight. James Bond was always in a fight that had nothing to do with the book. And uh, Well, uh, okay. Uh, that's, but he had a built-in likability because we learned from him from other You knew him books. from the previous yeah. books, yeah. And so you and you wanted him to win because he was James Bond. But but in, a, in a, a, a book, thrillers like mine, which do not have a series character, uh, you have to get the audience involved with these people. So halfway through is actually not a bad time for a big fight. So now you care about these two. And you care about the outcome of this fight. And you might have ambivalent feelings, but so long as your emotions are involved in that, then, because you see, the thing is, where there's emotional conflict in a story, it usually has a physical resolution. Think of Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier famous novel that uh, begins, uh, last night I dreamed I went to Manderley again. Manderley is this house where she has a terrible time. She's the second wife of Mr. De Winter. And the house feels as if it's haunted by the first Mrs. De Winter. And she goes through this terrible emotional struggle in this house. And how does the story end? The house burns down a physical resolution to an emotional conflict. Think about Anna Karenina, 
a respectable married woman who falls in love with a soldier who's a terrible guy and she just adores him and she can't help herself. She's a respectable woman. She knows it's wrong. She's even parted from her child because of this love affair. Terrible emotional conflict. How does it end? She throws herself under a train. It's a physical resolution to an emotional conflict. So a fight in a story must be a resolution or at least an important stage in an emotional conflict. Then you'll be interested in it. And then you'll, you won't want it to be over quickly because you want to see how it works out. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. DesignCrowd is a website that helps startups and small businesses outsource or crowdsource custom graphics, logos, and web design from over 500,000 designers around the world. A typical project, like if you, if you wanted a logo right now, You'd post it on Design Crowd what you need. You would get, on average, 60 to 100 designs from designers all over the planet. And rather than paying expensive fees like you would if you pitched an agency to do the logo, you can have exactly what you need within just three days. Once you have selected your favorite design, you will be sent all the files you require to update your branding or your website or your logo or whatever it is you ask to be designed. If you don't like any of the submitted designs, then Design Crowd offers a money-back guarantee. Kudos to them. As an example, Harvard Business School's Innovation Forum needed a logo and posted a project on Design Crowd offering $400, and they received over 267 logo designs from 57 designers around the world. You don't have to be Harvard Business School to use Design Crowd. You can start a project on Design Crowd from just $99. Check out designcrowd.com slash James, D-E-S-I-G-N-C-R-O-W-D dot com forward slash James to learn more and receive a special $100 VIP offer when you start your next project. Or simply enter the discount code James when posting a project on Design Crowd. What strikes me there is a parallel to just real world skill development. Maybe I'm making a stretch, but you had said you you were a big reader, a big reader. You you were studying, you know, how did Howard Robbins do it? How did Frederick Forsyth do it? Um, but you can only you can only you can figure it out in your mind or in your emotions, but you still have to actually do it yeah. physically. And so there is that, that parallel that physical actions are stronger than any emotion and any thought. And and what you're saying is how that plays out in a work of fiction. But I think that played out in your life. Like many people would have just dropped off and been discouraged by book six, book seven, book eight. You you If book 11 didn't work out, I'm sure you would have written book 12. <laughs> like I, you would have kept doing it. I don't know if you were depressed during this time. Many people get depressed when things don't work out the first 10 books. Were no, I did, I did know. Um, I'm afraid I have... I don't know what depression is like because it's never happened to me. Did, Touch wood. Were, you, were you like, like, oh, I'm going to publish the 11th book. It'll sell 2,000 copies and we'll put it on our table and I'll sit down and write the 12th. Well, I know I, what I was thinking was, um, what do I have to do to write better books? Because I mean, you know it was, was possible. You know it wasn't luck for these people. It, I do not think it was luck. No, I don't think so. And I felt that I knew enough about novels, because I'd read so many, uh, I knew enough that I, I really felt I wasn't far from breaking through. I wasn't far in my skills. I wasn't far from How could you tell? Something. I don't know. And I, maybe... Is that because you, when you were looking at other books, were you able to sort of see more all the things? Time, all the time I looked at other books I read, I read the bestsellers, uh, I looked at how they were marketed. Is it the marketing? But I knew it wasn't the marketing. It's the quality of the book itself. If the book is really good quality, the publisher will spend a lot of money marketing it. But the but the marketing doesn't make a bestseller. It never, it never happens that way around. So I knew it was the quality of the book. I had to write something that would completely absorb people and would catch people's attention. Particularly your first successful book has to have... It has to be kind of high concept because it has to be something that one person can say to another, you haven't heard of this guy, but his book is about snap and say it in a sentence and it's great. It's interesting because you're not writing about you because nobody cares about you. Nobody knows who you are at that point. Yeah. So it has to be high concept like World War II. That's something like somebody could say, as you just pointed, someone could say, 
you haven't fully read about World War II until you read this book about World War II. And so there's high concept, and then you break it down into thriller. So there's there's obviously with World War II, German spies versus the people trying to catch them, and then love story so that you learn to love the main characters involved, even though you might, you're probably all going to always love the situation. You know, you need to save England, but you need, but you have to also love the characters who are trying to do it. So there's many layers of love and and action and suspense. Will they, will their love work out? I mean, there was problems in Eye of the Needle that maybe their love wouldn't work out, like Absolutely. very personal, physical problems. And, uh, uh, but then also there's this high kinds of thing, which was we have to save England. Okay, so we have these layers and that creates these dramatic questions that that are throughout. But what are other beats of that first thriller that are somewhat technical even, that you were starting to figure out with 11 that you didn't figure out with 10? The What's happening to the central characters and the scrapes that they're getting into and the difficulties and following people and hiding from people, and so, all that is connected to something that's going to change the world. In the case of Eye of the Needle, that something is the D-Day invasion. And so it's it's important to explain to the reader why the D-Day invasion was touch and go. It could have failed. It could easily have failed. Enormous resources had been put into it. It still could have failed. And there was a deception plan, which was actually, in reality, was crucial. Because when our forces... American and British forces landed in Normandy. The Germans still thought they were coming to Calais. And the Germans did not send defensive forces across, west across the coast of France, to Normandy to repel the invasion until it was too late. And that was because of the deception plan. And I just want to stop you there. And and again, I apologize for interrupting so much, but I'm always just fascinated. But part of the suspense is built into the history Yes. But then you get even further. I feel like you get one layer deeper in the research because you're, you're. I mean, it's okay to give away a little bit on the eye of the needle. Part of your research is based on how Germans in who are spies tracked the troop movements. And that was very intricate level of detail and must have come from your research. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, all that, all that's very important. And if, if you're going to tell the reader that, This is something that could have changed history. In order to be convincing, you do have to show the reader that you know about this stuff. And and you have to, well, first you have to know about it. You have to really understand it. And then you have to show the reader that you understand it. So that kind of detail is very important for conviction in the novel. Would you go to the, like, did you go to the the train station where troop movements were tracked and and like so you could write about the exact specific well actually that that was london so i i I knew all those railway stations intimately anyway um uh most of my you you know what i got that was really useful to me uh so this is in uh, i wrote this book in uh 1977 uh in my and i've got and i couldn't afford to buy a lot of books in those days you know um, but I went to the public library, and in my local public library, they had a uh, a touring guide to Scotland that had been printed in 1947. <laughs> so it was 30 years old, completely useless for anybody who wanted to visit Scotland in 1977, but perfect for me because it described Scotland as it was during the war. So that's... That's interesting. Yeah, that's so all my stuff about uh, when, when Dinardel, Faber, the German spy disguised as an Englishman, is making his way north up through England and across Scotland. Uh, I I had all those details from the touring guide to Scotland. <laughs> so, so, so now I want to skip forward 40 years. Um, I mean, we didn't quite hit on every beat of the the thriller, but maybe we'll get back to that because I think that, that, that those qualities exist in all of your books. But it's hard to write about the same topic for 30 books. So obviously you didn't keep watch, writing about World War II, you switched many times. You even wrote one nonfiction book, which had the flavor of of a thriller. It was the the rescue of um, hostages in in Iran. On and, Wings of Eagles, yeah. Yeah, um, Wings of Eagles about the Perot's uh, rescue. And then you switched to, and I, I, I hate to use the word switch because I think you still do the same philosophy of writing, but you switched to uh, more period pieces. You would go into England in the 20s, 30s, and then ultimately into the series that begins this, 
and I say series loosely because you don't need to read any of the other books to to truly love and appreciate A Column of Fire, but uh, you go to 1200s England. What compelled your different fascinations? I became fascinated with the great cathedrals, the medieval cathedrals of, of Europe and particularly England. First of all, their architecture, they're very beautiful. But then I began to think, well, now, who, who built these incredible churches? And how did they build them? And Why were you asking those questions, though? Like, I feel like questioning, like these odd questions that then turn into novels, why would one kind of little question that you saw on a tour turn into a 900-page novel? Well, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, I suppose uh, I suppose that's what makes me a novelist because I have the kind of mind that does that. I look at something and I think, how was this done and who did it? And, and of course, always, always, is there a story in this for me? Um, and I, I was particularly interested in the question... Why did they build those cathedrals? Because these medieval people, you know, they lived in wooden houses and they slept on the floor. They were poor. And yet, they built the most beautiful buildings in the world. They are still the most beautiful buildings in the world. They were expensive. They were incredibly difficult to build because, you know... They in had, the 1200s. Yeah, and they had no mathematics, no structural engineering, nothing like that. It was guesswork. Incredibly difficult to build these great tall towers. Why did they do it? What drove those people? Now, now for a novelist, there's a good question. What drives them? So it's not just an ordinary person fumbling his way through life. It's, right, it's not just like who, like facts. It's There's got to be emotion behind it. What drives them? Yeah, what yeah, what did they want? What did they need? What were they? Uh, and of course the answer is complex. It's not a simple answer. You can't say, well, they did it for the glory of God, although that's one of the reasons. Uh, you can't say it because they had money that they didn't know what to do with, although that's a factor as well. Some people had money they didn't know what to do with. All of those things are combined. And when I looked into this and began to understand, at the same time as I began to understand all the forces that drove people to build cathedrals, I also began to see the threads of a novel coming together. Uh, I could see these different kinds of people, priests, businessmen, peasants, aristocrats. I could see all these different kinds of people living together. So what's like the first dramatic question that, that comes to mind where you feel like, okay, I can almost coagulate these questions into that first dramatic question that drives the novel? Well, I suppose um, The Pillars of the Earth, which is the book we're talking about, actually begins with quite a slow burn. We begin with a stonemason who can't find work. So we begin with a man who doesn't know how he's going to feed his family next week. Which we can all relate to. Yeah, it's very easy to imagine that, how desperate you would feel and the lengths you would go to. And the second chapter is about a monk who is dedicated and sincere and finds himself among a group of people, group of monks who are not dedicated and not sincere. And so now we have kind of almost a saintly guy, but principled, coming up against these rather sleazy, corrupt types. And he goes absolutely, unhesitatingly, face to face in combat with them about what they're doing wrong. This could be like a book about Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> but yes well it's a and that's because it's a moral conflict isn't it and uh, so you're thinking to yourself what questions occurred in the minds of people in the 1200s that everybody could relate to right now a man oh, who's trying to feed his family uh, uh, a group of monks who have these easy sinecures but don't necessarily have the the value system and beliefs that we always think monks should have that's right. So now we have come across two groups of people. We've come across the builders <clears throat> and we've come across the monks who are going to operate this great cathedral and who are going to have to be in charge of it, going to kind of own it. And then, we, then we're going to meet some businessmen in this town where the cathedral is going to be built. And we're also going to meet, we're going to meet an aristocrat. And of course, it's the Middle Ages. So if you're a lord... You are above the law. 
you can do anything you like, and we're going to see this guy taking full advantage of the fact that he can do anything the heck he likes. So now we have this, each of these people has their life and their story, and some of them you're going to love and admire, and some of them you're going to absolutely hate. Uh, we have, so we have all these people involved, and, and a thriller is like, um, or, or a novel of ordinary length, about 100,000 words, is like a snapshot of a group of people in the middle of their lives. And it covers, it can cover a week or a month or maybe even a year or two. But a book like The Pillars of the Earth or A Column of Fire, a long book can tell you the whole biography of these characters. So not only do you see them through a crisis, you see the whole of their lives. You see how their lives develop. You see whether or not the really evil people get their come up, comeuppance in the end, and you see whether or not the good people manage to achieve what they're trying to achieve. So the difference between the pillars of the earth and everything I'd written before was the sp- was the scope of the whole thing. Right, and then and then really, the, I mean, it's this the it's almost these same families like th- like three hundred years later. You kind of follow. I mean, again, a column of fire stands on its own completely. It's you wouldn't even think it's part of a series. Which it may or may you may or may not consider it that way, or just using the same um, areas. But uh, what are what do you feel are the same beats that you're trying to hit in a column of fire that you would hit in a traditional spy novel or or thriller? Well, there's a there's a huge political earthquake in a column of fire. It happens in the middle of the 16th century, and it's Protestantism. And it's a it's a religious conflict again, high concept, World War Two, yes, Protestantism. Exactly, you're exactly right. Here is something that completely disrupts Europe in the 16th century and causes terrible wars, terrific bloodshed, hatred between countries, hatred between individuals. Uh, the, the famous Spanish Inquisition, which is basically basically torturing people because of their beliefs. And all this comes about because of this new version of Christianity called Protestantism. But what interests me about this is not the conflict between Protestants and Catholics so much, because like most people today, you know, I don't think one of them's wicked and one of them's perfect. You know, who who cares about Protestantism and Catholic Catholicism nowadays? And very few people, you know, most Catholics and most Protestants would say, "Well, yeah, yeah, they believed something different from me, but we're all Christians." So it's not that. What interests me is the few rare people in the 16th century who said we shouldn't kill each other for our religion. We should be tolerant. Now, the the notion of religious tolerance was brand new in the 16th century. And and by the way, that had to be researched because I, for instance, was not aware that there was religious tolerance. Well, it was certainly a minority view, but there were a few people, and there were, interestingly enough, there were three important leaders who were who believed in tolerance, and all three were women. Kind of interesting. Queen Elizabeth I of England, Queen Catherine of France, who is known as Catherine de' Medici because she uh, was Italian by birth, although she became the Queen of France, and Margaret of Parma, who was governor of the Netherlands. So these three women, who were powerful and important, their approach was, let's try and keep the peace between Catholic and Protestant. But they were constantly undermined by others, usually men, who said, no, 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 we have to kill all those people. Catholics said, we have to kill all the Protestants, and the Protestants said, we got to kill all the Catholics, or expel them from our country, or whatever. So the idea, which is a, an idea I think very precious to us now, of religious tolerance, was, was extremely unpopular and considered kind of a lunatic idea in the 16th century. And so, of course, I admire the people who were brave enough to stand up for it. And so as a beat, though, how do you make turn that into a beat in the novel that drives the novel? What's What are the important things that you know when you start outlining this, you're going to have to hit? So we're going to have to introduce this group and, and their troubles, you know, the fact that they can't succeed really at what they're trying to do. Um, but, but how do you, what what's the conflict that kind of drives it forward? Uh, how, do, how do you come up with that process of what that conflict will be? Well, um, there are, there's not one, but there's a whole series of 
uh, dramatic events. And quite central to a column of fire is the fact that there was there were many conspiracies to assassinate Queen Elizabeth the uh, First. They were, and I hadn't been aware of that either until this book. I'm assuming the research is all good. Oh yes, the yes these these assassination conspiracies were planned usually in Paris by uh, French ultra Catholics and English Catholics who were in exile. And because of these plots, Queen Elizabeth set up the first English secret service. So uh, Ned Willard, who's one of the heroes of the story, goes to work for Queen Elizabeth and he becomes part of her secret service. And this was one of the things that intrigued me about the idea. Uh, We talked earlier about spies and what is fascinating about spies. And I was just intrigued by the notion of these people who do a lot of the things that modern spies do. They send letters in code. They have specialist decoders who can unscramble any code that you put in front of them. They have all that modern stuff, and yet, of course, they're dressed in doublet and hose and have Shakespeare beards. And uh, it all takes place at a time when uh, uh, to send a message from Paris to London, instead of taking a nanosecond as it does now, would, would take a week. So it's... So I was intrigued, and I don't know, how's that going to work out? You know, it's, it's going to be all this espionage and following people around and all intercepting messages and all that stuff, but it's also going to be uh, at a time of slow transport, slow communications, uh, no electric light in the streets at night and all that. And so, so um, by, by the end of the book, we almost, again, we have the, the thriller aspects, the spy aspects, the romance aspects, obviously. What would you say defines like what's what's a a typical scene that defines your type of book you're gonna always if i read a ken follow book this is the type of scene i'm gonna eventually hit and it's gonna be the best i'm I'm not gonna find this type of scene anywhere else this is a ken follett scene um well now that's a really interesting question um the the scenes that readers often talk to me about are the love scenes Hmm. And um, by the way, that's what I remember from "I Have the Needle." Okay. <laughs> so, oh, that okay? Yeah. So tw- twenty-five years ago. <laughs> well, then it must have been a good scene. <laughs> well, that's great because if something stays in a reader's memory, that's a great compliment to the writer. So thank you for that. Um, I do get um, complaints about the love scenes as well because there are some readers who would rather not know the details of a love scene. And um, every now and again, a rather uh, strict mother somewhere in the Midwest will catch her son or daughter um, reading The Pillars of the Earth or Eye of the Needle at the age of 15 or 16 and, and, and... flick through the book and unfortunately fall upon a a fairly graphic sex scene and say, I'm not having my child reading this stuff. Um, And I actually, I mean, I'm very interested. I I really don't want to displease anybody. Uh, Even even if I might think they're being a bit prudish, I still don't want to displease a reader. So at one stage, I I used to give a talk in bookshops about writing the sex scenes. And um, I talked about, you know, some people who didn't like them and, and objected to them. And, but the people in the, my audience always used to say to me, keep writing the sex scenes because, um, first of all, because they enjoy them. But secondly, because if there's a love story, then sooner or later it has some physical expression. And the modern reader wants to be there when that happens. In the old days, you closed the bedroom door. But modern readers are sophisticated, and they know that um, that the the honeymoon isn't always the end of all troubles. And so what they what modern readers want to know is that when the the couple who are in love finally get in bed together, they have a good time. And again, this is related to having a fight. If there's two strong emotions, against someone eventually they have to have a fight in the book or just if there's a german spy versus a british spy someone's gonna have to kill somebody yes <laughs> so so you're exactly and, right and, and again i think this is related to success you could dream all you want about being a writer but you still have to write and if it doesn't work you have to write the next book and you know with ned and his romance in a column of fire it's it takes a long time sometimes to succeed yes and i think that's kind of um 
that's like the arc of many of your books is that, you know, anything worth having is worth working for to get that to that physical expression. And in some ways, I mean, sometimes people say that every love story is Romeo and Juliet in that two people love each other, but they can't be together for some reason. And the reason doesn't matter. In Romeo and Juliet, it's because their families hate one another. Uh, but broader might, premise. Hmm? The broader premise of Romeo and Juliet, there was this kind of like class sort of thing happening. Yes. And it can be there, it can be another reason. It can be um, uh, it can be racial. It because it can be because one of them is Jewish and the other's not, or one of them's black and the other's white. Or it, it you know in, if it's a war story, it could be a German officer in love with a French girl in the World, Second World War. There's got to be something that forbids their love. So for several hundred pages, you've got two people gazing at one another across a crowded room and wishing that they could be alone together. And uh, and you put the reader through all that. And then, of course, at some point, you've got to give the reader the reward. But the longer, the longer we live with these two people wishing for it, the more they and we are going to enjoy it when it actually happens. Oh, my God, that's a great quote. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> the longer we wish for it, the more we'll enjoy it. <laughs> I might have to. I might have to title the story that. Um, so, Ken Follett, author of Column of Fire. I want to be respectful of your time. This is a great book, and I feel like you never gave up. In the sense that it's very easy for you to write a book. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's probably easy for you to write a book and say, "Okay, people are going to read this regardless of whether it's good or not." Because now, after 31 books, I've established myself. I've sold 150 million books. I'm going to sell at least a few million of these or whatever. I just want to ask a general question, but, but, but you didn't give up. You, you, put, you could tell you put your all in all of these things we just talked about. You put your all into this, your 31st book, A Column of Fire, the research, the dramatic questions on each page, the, the, the forbidden love, obviously, many things, many dramatic questions all throughout and the broader premises. Um, so I highly recommend it. Uh, do you think reading in today's day and age has changed? Like millennials now can consume, I, I hate to use the generational word millennials. Yeah, people now in general can consume quality content in four minute YouTube clips, as opposed to putting in the work required to read a big novel. Do, do you think entertainment consumption has changed? Well, it's certainly changed, but, um, and, and I've heard people say, you know, a tweet is 140 letters, characters, and spaces, and and it's got the full arc of the hero in it. Yeah, the, yeah, the, well, a good one. It, yeah, exactly. That, uh, but I think um, I've proved the opposite, haven't I? Because I'm writing very long books, and uh, sometimes people are funny about the fact that they're long books. You know, they uh, one one person said this one's another cat squasher. And, uh, you know, you shouldn't drop, you'd be careful not to drop it on your cat and that kind of thing. Uh, but the fact <laughs> of the matter is, if you do it right, people love long books. And yeah. I think it's partly because um, you, you live with these people for a much longer time. Instead of a, a novel which you could read between New York and Los Angeles, you've got a novel that you're going to be living with for a month or so. And you're going to really know these people. By the way, I'm a fast reader. So New York to Los Angeles, okay. it was, was, that, that meant it was a long book. <laughs> okay, well, it's, 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 let's say London to Los Angeles. Right. You know, that, but, e but, but even so, um, you, you feel that you really know these people, you know how their kids turn out. Uh, and... Uh, that's really a different kind of experience, and I've proved that if you do it right, if you, so long, you know, you can't be boring. You can never be boring. Henry James said, "The only sin an author can commit is to be dull," and that's true. If you're dull, you 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 know, if you're but that's boring, where the planning comes in. That's where your yes. outline comes in to make sure yes. in advance right. there's going to you can. It's not like you're winging it while you're writing. You know, there's going to be a dramatic question or two or three or four of different levels on every single page. Yes, that's exactly right. Yes, and if you do that, then you can write a very long book, and people will really enjoy it. Because again, it's not like 140 characters lives on its own. You have 140 characters 
in this 900 page book but just over and over again <laughs> so you're do you you keep uh, the reader you keep the reader going a page at a time you're not expecting them to finish the book and say oh yeah i'm glad i read 900 pages it's oh, every no. page they have to say i'm glad i'm on this page yeah. yeah well it's um sometimes i think that fiction is fractal in that whether yes. you look at it in the large scale or the small scale it's always the same shape so, of course, the book has a beginning, a middle, and an end, but each chapter should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And within that chapter, each scene should oh have God. a beginning, a middle, and an end. I love this. So let's 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 close not on this, but on how that exactly applies to life. Because I feel like people go through uh, the school system, educational system, they get a job as a paralegal, they get promotions, and they do that for 40 years and they retire. But I think Instead, living life as a fractal is much more interesting way to do it, and you've clearly done that. You, you know, you you've made each component of your life uh, interesting and challenging, and having a dramatic question. You know, we didn't talk about this, but both in your um, political life, your uh, personal life, your, your obviously your career life, and your in your life of of achieving peak performance or something, and you constantly switched uh, genres or at least your broader premises. You constantly switched instead of trying to hammer out the same formula. So I feel like you've you've it's important to also do that with life. Would would you agree? I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, you because you have a big picture of your life. I I want to be successful. I want to raise great kids. Uh but you also look at what I'm going to do this year. What am what am I going to achieve this year? Okay. What what would I really like to do what would I what, what how where would I like to get? And you might say that for this week. And you might say that when you get up in the morning. Okay. What am I going to achieve today? Yeah, well, today I achieved talking to one of my favorite writers, Ken Follett, author of A Column of Fire. Uh, great book. I highly recommend it. I've read so many of your books. You've written 31 of your books. I, I didn't read 31, but I did start. By the way, how'd you like I, I how I started this podcast? So I established likability with you by talking about Capricorn One. No one, <laughs> no one funny. has ever spoken to you about Capricorn One before in any interview ever. Okay, I haven't seen it, and I've watched a lot of your interviews to prepare for this, and I've read a lot of your books, and uh, and then we now, got right into it. Here's the trivia question: Do you remember the pseudonym that that was used that I used for Capricorn One? No. <laughs> well, I do. I, I didn't pick it, but the publisher did. It was Bernard L. Ross. <laughs> Oh man, I don't. I don't don't ask that. me why. <laughs> I just remember loving it because, again, I never saw the movie. A lot of people, O.J. Simpson was in the movie. I never saw the movie, and I only. But I was a t- I was a science fiction kid, so I wanted to read this book. Right, right. And only later I realized it was by you. You know, after I read Eye of the Needle and, and all these others. So, so thank you once again for coming on the podcast, Ken. A column of fire. Get it on Amazon. Great book. A uh, really pleasure to meet you. I've Thanks enjoyed so much. it. Thanks very much. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network at jamesaltucher.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Before you go, I wanted to just say thank you to everyone who has rated and reviewed this podcast on iTunes. Anna Scheinman, Andrew Roan, The Unicorn Queen, Soul Surf Recovery, and every other person out there who is listening and sharing I really, really can't thank you enough for your ongoing support and reviews. Thanks. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.